Good evening and thank you so much for coming out. This is part of a series of lectures that we are going to be offering Wednesday nights. I've had the pleasure of working with a doctor and Dr. Gluck and my fondest memory of them was during the pandemic. We tried and we succeeded in offering uh, a lot of programs through Zoom and online for those of you who were stuck at home. And they were the first people I approached. We were so nervous. Do you remember that? We couldn't figure out the audio. We couldn't figure out how to share the screen. But we did it. But we did it. And that was the first of many, many, many lectures and lunches and programs that we were able to do. So in my heart, <laughs> I have a very, very special place for them. And I know uh, if you've never heard them, they are incredible. Uh, they have an incredible collection of art. Uh, like no one else and the knowledge that they possess and are here to share with you will definitely enrich your lives. So here they are, Dr. and Dr. Gluck. Thanks, Roxy. What Roxy didn't tell you about that very first one, if you remember and if you had a chance to partake in any of them, if you signed up, you got a lunch delivered. So we're in the middle of the presentation, about halfway through, and the, the doorbell rings. And I, I said, who could be? I go, it was our lunch. <laughs> the Roxy, she, she didn't want us to be left out, so she arranged for us to get lunch as well. So thank you, Roxy, and it's, it's great to be here. Um, th this is an expanded version of what some of you may have heard parts of previously, and it's going to talk about our collection and put it in some context for you. I want, this is the opening of an, one of the three museum shows we did from our collection. Those were our, all our, a num number of our totem poles. And the slides that you're going to see, both the archival photographs as well as most of the objects you'll see in this presentation, are in our collection. So we still have most of them. We're, they're spread all over the place, but we have most of them. So the first question we always get is, you're in South Florida. What, what do you have to do with Northwest Coast Native American art? That, you couldn't be further away in the continental United States. So this is our story and how this interest began. Joan and I were married almost 53 years ago in Philadelphia. We were both in medical school at the time. You're from Philadelphia? No, no, <laughs> Oh, married, <laughs> all right. And, and we were students. We were had arranged to do some research and study at Uni University of Southern California, LA County Hospital in Los Angeles. Our honeymoon consisted, we had six to seven weeks traveling cross country to get to LA. But having grown up in the Northeast, I'm from Boston, Jones from Philadelphia, uh, we met in New York, we decided to do, see national parks, and we had an interest in Native American sites. So that's the route we took. We went up across the Trans-Canadian Highway, down through the Great Lakes, went to Pipestone, Minnesota. Our first piece of Native American art was, was catlinite, is what they make peace pipes out of. Traveling a little further into the Black Hills, we got some Black Hills pottery, venturing up into Canada. That was our very first mask. It's here on the table. I still remember we had, we're students, we didn't have any, $65 is what that mask cost us. Worth a few more dollars today, but that's our very, very first one in the collection. We spent a few months in Los Angeles. Then we arranged to do some research and study at, at Jackson Memorial here in Miami. So now we did the Southern route, same strategy, Native American sites, national parks. There's a Kachina doll from the Southwest, that's a mud head, and a, a Navajo rug getting to Florida, we spent three months and head back to New York. So over the years, we decided, well, what are we going to collect? What really interests us? And I think this captures exactly what drew us to that. It's not just the aesthetic of this beautiful art, but when you understand the beauty of the Native American culture, it is something that really, you know, we call, we, they call them savages. They could teach us a thing or two about taking care of the environment. It's just a beautiful culture. So you'll hear a little bit about the culture. And here's our central premise. We're going to talk to you about the environment of the Northwest Coast. And these native tribes were products of that environment. So from that environment, they developed this beautiful culture. And then from this culture, they were able to establish this great aesthetic 
that we call art, they did not have a word for art. These were ceremonial and utilitarian things that they, they, they produced. So Joan's gonna talk about the environment first so you can see this beautiful region. How many people have traveled to the Pacific Northwest? Okay, so it is just a beautiful area and a number of you have been there. So I wanted to talk about the environment in the Northwest Coast. And in the Ice Age, which was a long time ago, there was a land bridge that connected Asia with North America. How all of North America became populated through that land bridge. So the first settlements that the archaeologists have found are in Kodiak Island, which is in Alaska, and they can date it to nine or 10,000 years ago. So they've been here for a very, very long time. And the first people who came across settled in one of the first places they came to because it was such a, an incredibly good place to live. And the reason that it's a good place to live is because the climate is very mild. It's mild because they have a current very much like the Gulf Stream that we have that modulates our weather. They have the Japanese current that runs in the Pacific up the coast. And if you look in the white circle, you'll see the coastal area where they live, where these people live. It's all little tiny inlets that are, many of them are protected by islands that are off the shore. So um, it, it's, a, it's a protected area. The other thing is there's a mountain range where that red arrow is, the coastal mountains. So they were protected from anybody who was gonna try and attack them. They couldn't get over those mountains. So it was a safe area and it was a very comfortable area to live in. And um, since we're gonna be talking about the art, these are called the Three Watchmen. And if you ever go to the Northwest, you'll see those on the top of many of the poles. Poles can be 20 feet tall. But the Three Watchmen are there because they're watching for danger. And they only need three. They only need to watch the ocean and the north and the south. They don't need to watch the mountains because they know nobody's gonna come over the mountains anyway. So that's why there's only three watchmen. The people in this area live from Yucatan Bay, which is up in Alaska, all the way down to the Cor Columbia River area. And there are many different tribes. Each of them are relatively isolated from each other because there are no roads. And the only way you can get between the different villages is by boat. So they, they all tend to have slightly different looks to their art, slightly different bents to their stories, um, and even their languages are a little bit different. So one of the things that makes this area so special is the forests. It's, it's a very verdant area, and the trees are mainly the Sitka, the spruce, and the Sitka spruce, the hemlock, and the cedar. The cedar is especially important. That's the tree on the right. It grows very straight. And when you have a very straight tree, you can do a lot of useful things with it. You can make it into a canoe, you can use it to help you build a house, and you can certainly make a totem pole. They also had a lot of berries and plants growing in the forest. So they didn't really have to farm. They could get their food from what was available in the land. And the women were the ones who gathered the berries, and they would use a basket with a trump line. That's the colorful line that you see there. And it would go right on their forehead, and then the basket would be on their back. And it's called a burden basket, obviously, because it carries the burden. And this, the cedar tree was useful not just because it could be a log, but even the bark was used in weaving, and it was used to make clothing. That skirt is a cedar bark skirt. And this photo is from our collection. We have a folio of, of photos that were taken by Edward Curtis. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he was, um, a, he decided he was gonna photograph all of the native people in our country before they disappeared. So he spent many years traveling all around North America, Canada and North America, photographing the native tribes. 
and uh, trying, trying to memorialize before them before they disappeared. There was also a lot of wildlife in the forests and the natives did use the goats and the beavers and the bears and you know they hunted all of these animals. Because they were so close to nature, many of the figures that they drew, that they carved, that they put into their art were from nature. Some of them were fantastic imaginary beasts, but a lot of them were from nature. So this is a bear and on the right is a very old rattle and because this is a living culture still, it did not disappear, there are modern artists that go back to the old styles and do modern versions. So the other rattle is a bronze rattle that's relatively contemporary. But you can see the fangs and you can see the ears and those are very typical of a bear. Now for the smaller animals, the natives developed a deadfall trap. So they would have a heavy weight held up by a stick and there's also something called a trap stick that's right here that's used to hold up this one. If the animal comes in underneath number four where the food is, it'll, it'll knock that stick and the rock will fall on them and it'll stun them enough that, that they can be captured. The other thing that you need to understand about this culture is that everything has a spirit. We all have animal spirits and the animals all have spirits. And the spirits are very powerful and they can be used to help you. So on the trap sticks, there would be a spirit. And this one, I always think this looks like E.T. But this one, this one is an eagle with a fish. And these are trap sticks that are made out of bone. Between the land and the ocean are all these other islands and then going into the land there are lots of rivers and the rivers were used for navigation and also they were a source of food and fur and especially the beaver. There are lots of beaver up there and so the beaver ends up in the yard and this is our house pole that we have and you can, if you ever go to see an exhibit or go to the Northwest and you see a pole, you can always know if it's a beaver because the beaver will always have big teeth, it will always be holding a stick, and it will always have a hatched tail. So after a while, you begin to recognize what these are. Okay, and the salmon were very, very important to the Northwest Coast because this was this was a renewable resource. Every year the salmon would come back to spawn so they would have an abundance of food and then that food could be, the salmon could be dried and preserved and it would last through the winter. And their winters weren't that bad but they were very dark. So here you can see the pictures of the salmon and we brought in our salmon rattle so you can see how they depict the salmon on the rattle. And there was a special technique they developed for, for catching the salmon. They, would, they had this fish hook and the, um, you, can, you can see that's an old um, etching of natives catching the fish and then they're still doing it to this day. And there were so many fish coming in that all you had to do was stick it in the water and pull it up and there would be a fish. On the ocean, there were also a lot of natural resources that they could take advantage of. So there were shellfish in the ocean, and we, we brought it, we, had a, we have a rattle that looks like the mollusk, looks like the mussels, and we also have a pipe that has clamshell on it. We, did, we brought that one in too, if you want to see it. And that's a photo, Curtis photo of a woman digging up the clams. And you can see the canoe made from the cedar tree. Every tribe had a different prow on, it, on its canoe. And then the men would go out into the ocean and in their canoes hunting mostly halibut. There was one tribe, the Macaw, that were hunting whale, that did hunt whales, but it was really a ceremonial thing. They didn't hunt whales on a regular basis. But 
in order to get the halibut, what you have to realize is the halibut can grow to be enormous, bigger than two of those tables put together. So if you have a canoe of a certain size, you don't want to get a halibut that's going to swamp your canoe. So what they had to do was develop a way of catching the right size halibut. And it, it's really very ingenious. The hook, so when they pulled the halibut into the canoe, they could knock it over the head with the club so it wouldn't thrash around and swamp the boat. And the hook was made at a certain angle with, with a spirit attached, but it was the size for a medium-sized halibut that would fit into the boat. And that they, they made it, and it, so it was measured at a certain size. So if the fish was too big, the, the mouth was too big to get, get into, the, into the hook to get the bait. And if the fish was too small, he couldn't get into the bait. So it had to be the right size. When the explorers came from Russia and from America, and they said, these hooks are ridiculous, they quickly realized that those hooks were really ingenious, not ridiculous. And we have several that have lots of bite marks on it, so we know that they were used and they, they did catch fish. And this is one you can see, it's got a, an otter for the spirit. I have, I have arrows and there's a metal bar. <laughs> and the otter is there to help bring the spirit, bring the, the spirit helps bring the fish to the hook. And these are the otters. You know, they had otter, they're adorable. And um, there's a man hunting the otter with his bow and arrow. And unfortunately, because the otter skin, the otter fur is the densest fur in the world, it was highly prized. Because of that, they were practically hunted to, to extinction. And um, in, in just three years, over 100,000 of them were caught and killed. Many of them were for the trade between America and Russia. I think they were popular with hats at one time. They made otter hats. So, so what I'd like you to remember is that these people basically lived in their grocery store. They didn't have to go far for shopping. So because of that, they were what we call affluent foragers. They had everything they needed. They had knowledge. They developed very efficient tools. And because of that, they had leisure time, which is to do a lot of things, which is some to build houses, to carve, to paint, to weave, to do a lot of things, which many of the other native tribes that you may know about did not have. When you think about chasing the buffalo herd across the plains or living in a desert, you don't have this luxury. So these people were very fortunate. They chose the right place to live. So, so the term that's used is complex cultural practices. So they, during the spring, summer, and fall, they were collecting the food. They, they took, on the picture of the halibut, you saw them drying the fish for the winter. Over the winter time, when the days were very short, and it was a little bit more difficult climate to go out and do all these things, that's when they developed ceremonies, that's when they, they uh, uh, had songs and dances and all, all kinds, and, and, and did a lot of this art. So we're going to talk a little bit about the village life and then get into some of the ceremonies. So if you went along the coast, you would see these villages, and they always sort of had the same design. In the middle would be, these are long houses, and these were for family units. From 40 to 60 people would live in one of these. The middle one, you can see with the tallest totem pole, was the chief's house. So he got the best spot right in the middle, and then the tribe had uh, houses around him. Tribes. Oh, so there are 10 different tribes, so you, 10 of them. So the northernmost tribe is called the Tlingit. The southernmost tribe was called the Kwakutl, that's an older term. Now they call them up the Kwak Kwak Wa. And in the center was a tribe called the Haida. And there were probably seven or eight others that I can name in between. So, but like Joan said, these tribes all were similar, 
all shared some practices, but they, they were distinctly different, and you could see differences in the art if you start to study it. So there was the chief's house right in the middle, and this is what it would look like. And that would be the entrance of the house through that central totem pole, and you can see the hole in the middle. People would crawl in through that. Within the house, there was this hierarchy. So the door is over here in my side of this house. Way in the other end, furthest from the door, was the chief, and the elite families would then have their place there. There was some storage room. The red area in the middle was for everybody else in that particular 40 to 60 person unit. And they did have slaves. And of course, they gave the slaves the part closest to the door where they might get breezes and, 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 and uh, rained on. So this is a picture inside a reproduction of, a long, of one of these long houses. So you can see the raised platform where that gentleman is standing. And those big poles on the corners, those are called house poles. And that beaver pole that we showed you is basically a house pole that we have. And basically, those poles on the corner carry most of the weight of the house. They, these are long beams that go through the house on the, on the two sides. So two long beams would be supported by those house poles. And there's that fire pit in the middle, and then the benches on the side for the commoners. These are pictures, there's our pole on the right-hand side, and these are some pictures of some other ones. And you can see how that log would fit right in the center of that, and it would carry most of the weight of these long houses. And these are clan poles, so there's the beaver clan. The one closest to us here is an, a, a, an eagle, and the one further back is that bear that you saw with his tongue out and his fangs. The, one of the key tenets of the culture is being one with nature. And they have this wonderful philosophy. We are on Earth for a limited amount of time as people. It is our role to preserve the environment for future generations. We are caretakers of our environment. And that's something very different than what may, maybe Western European philosophy is, is where we, we try to subvert nature for our own good. There we want to take care of nature so other generations can have it. So there's this oneness with the environment, this, this shared being a custodian for the environment, and, the, and they're very spiritual people. So the thought is every one of the people in the tribe had an animal spirit in them. And every animal had a person in them. So there was this constant back and forth and transformation between the animal world and the natural world and the human world. And that's reflected in some of their arts. Over the winter months, as I, we said, this is a time when they had leisure time, if you will. They weren't hunting, they weren't fishing, they weren't gathering. They would be in the long house around the fires, and lots of ceremonies happened. So this is a mass that used to be in our collection. It's now in a museum in Massachusetts. That's a transformation. On the left-hand side is a raven. But this, and when it opened up, it was almost five feet across. And when it opened inside, the raven is a carving of a human. So this is a transformation human to raven, back and forth. So those jaws open. One of the most important ceremonies that occurred during these winter months was called the Hamatsa ceremony. This is a coming of age ceremony. And it was a secret society where young men would go out into the forest and they'd stay there for days, they'd take some hallucinogenic plants, they'd go into trance, then they would come back and they would assume the persona of one of these three birds. They called them the mythic birds. So the raven, we know what ravens look like, but these other birds don't exist in nature, the hook hook and the crooked beak of heaven. And they'd dance around, they'd be singing and dancing, and at the end of this several day of out in the forest and this long ceremony, these men were then accepted uh, they came of age and were part of the elite of the tribe. In the ceremony, the story is the raven plucks out people's eyes and they dance. And the hook hook would crack their skulls and eat their brains. And the crooked beak would eat the heart. And that was all put on and none of that really happened. There was a misunderstanding when they had contact with the Americans and the Canadians and they thought they really were cannibalistic and they never were. That was just a ceremonial thing. But that's called the Hamatsa dance, and it was a coming of age and initiation into a very prestigious society. What was very important during these ceremonies was storytelling. And they would tell these amazing stories, 
And what are stories for? Well, before they could write, the stories served a number of purposes. And this is not only true in the Northwest Coast Society, this is true in societies all around the world. Why do we tell stories? To explain the natural world. Look at the Bible we have as a story of how the world came to be and how we came to be. <coughs> the social order, to teach morality, Noah in the ark, for entertainment purposes. So there's lots of reasons why stories are told. When you look at art, it always tells a story. Sometimes you have to invent the story because it's modern art and it's abstract and who knows. And sometimes you can really see the story. And if you look at this picture, you know the story. In Western culture, we all know this story. Well, everything in native art also has a story. We just don't know them all. But it's, it's important to understand that we, these really do have more meaning than just weird illustrations. Um, we did an exhibit, as Paul said, that was called Finding Raven, talking about each piece and the fact that it had the story and telling some of those stories. A native storyteller. And the nice thing about that is that they have a whole different cadence to the way they speak. And it's very dramatic because in the, in the winters when they put on these productions, think of it like a Broadway show. They had curtains, they had, I don't know if they had stage lights, but they had costumes, certainly. They had trap doors in the floor, they had people coming up from the ceiling, they had fake blood. They, they really dramatized things to make it entertaining, just like a regular show would be entertaining for us. So the story of Raven stealing the sun is one that's pretty much in every tribe. Uh, you'll get to see some of it. This way, on a good way, go away, Raven was walking along the beach, and at the beginning of time, the world was dark. The stars, the moon, and sun were kept in boxes by a wealthy old man. He lived at the headwaters of the Nas River. The fishermen of the night told Raven of these treasures, and so Raven went to the house of the old man. Raven went to the house of Nashak Pankau. And it was there that Raven saw the old man's beautiful daughter. She was drinking water from the stream. So Raven, he had a plan. Raven changed his spirit into a tiny hemlock needle. And when that beautiful daughter went to drink her water, Raven, he floated down and fell in her cup. And when she drank that water, and she swallowed the water. And she also swallowed Raven. And soon she became pregnant to give birth to Raven in the form of a human child. <laughs> now everyone loved this child. Everyone loved this child except the mother-in-law. You see, it was the mother-in-law. She really knew that it was Raven. Because if you've seen Raven's eyes, they go up and down, back, forth, and all around. <laughs> she knew that it was Raven, but nobody listened to the mother-in-law. They thought that she was just crazy, this Away, or just call a shoe and say you're crazy, you're all crazy. Nobody listens to the mother in law. And you'll still find to this day nobody <laughs> listens to the mother in law. <laughs> Raven had a plan. He was going to get the stars, the moon, and sun for all the people of the world. So, Raven, that baby in the form of in the spirit in the form of a child, Raven's spirit, points to that corner of the house, the box that contained the stars, and he began to cry. The old man goes, Hey, no, you can't have that box. But he gave it to his grandchild. That old man took that box down, the box that contained the stars, and he placed it in front of his grandchild. And he says, you're going to open that box now. And that little baby went, okay. <laughs> so he played on that box. He ate on the box. He danced on that box. <laughs> and when nobody was looking, what do you think he did? He opened the box, and out of the box, the what? The stars. couldn't be upset. He loved his little grandchild. That baby, Raven, How much do you want to play? that baby, pointed to the other I'll tell you the house, I'll give you a that contained the moon, and he began to cry. Ooh, 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 ooh. The old man went, eh, no, you can't have 
the fox. I beg you, cry some more. down the box that contained the moon. And he said, now you don't open that box. And this time the baby went, oh. <laughs> So he played on the box. He ate on the box. He danced on that box. Oh, and nobody you tell about this time. What do you think he did? How? Oh. He opened that box. Now the box flew out. The moon into the night cloud sky forever. But he couldn't be upset. He loved his little grandchild. Now, Raven. Raven is patient. He's very patient. Raven, he pointed to the other corner of the house. The box contained the sun, and he began to cry. The old man got Claire. Gloria can't have that box. The baby cries some more. So you know what happens next, right? <laughs> he ate on the box, he danced on the box, and he opened the box, and the sun came out, and he grabbed the sun in his mouth, and he changed back into a raven, and flew out the chimney, and put the sun in the sky. And that's why raven is black. So this mask tells that story. We've got the old man, and we've got the raven, sitting on the box, holding the sun in his mouth. And this is actually a mask that moves, and the hands will go above the face when you pull that string on the bottom. I don't know if we have that or not. There he is. Yeah, because he's so upset that he lost his sun and his moon and his stars. And interestingly, a couple years ago, the Postal Service came out with a stamp with the raven stealing the sun. He's got the sun in his mouth. And the stars are around also. And that's the hand changing back into the raven's wing. So if you know the story, you really understand the stamp. Otherwise, it just looks like a black and white bird with polka dots. So it's good to know the stories. So along with telling the stories, which are owned by the chief, by the way, and you can only really, nobody else can tell them unless you get the permission of the chief. There are also songs that go with the stories and they're dances. And we just wanted to show you a short clip of, of one of the raven dances and you'll see how big the mask is. Some of these raven masks can be six feet long. They're enormous. And I want you to listen for the sound of the raven. He goes, ok, ok, ok. the raven. And the raven is really one of the key figures in many, many of the stories. Um, the origin of man, there are many myths that go with the origin of man. The western myth is man was made from clay. And the northwest coast myth is man came from the ocean. And the story is the raven was walking on the shore and he saw a clamshell. And there was a lot of noise coming from the clamshell. So he was very curious. So he went over and he pecked at it and pecked at it and finally opened it up. And out came man. 
So this drum is the story of the origin of man. Paul said one of the other things we tell stories for is what are the origins of things? So where did mosquitoes come from? The swamp, yes. The story is, the story is that Sinoqua, the wild woman in the woods, who's very large and not very bright, but takes care of the animals and likes to eat children, is wandering along. And she has a burden basket. You remember we talk, I talked about the burden basket. She's got her burden basket. And if children go wandering in the woods by themselves, Sinoqua can capture them and throw them in her basket and take them back to her cottage. It's sort of like Hansel and Gretel. Maybe that's where it came from. And one time she caught, the chil she caught two children, a boy and a girl, and she took them back to her cottage. And as she was getting ready to eat them, she was tamping up the fire. The little girl was there, and, and Sunoko says, my, you have very pretty earrings. And the little girl says, well, I'm happy to give you the earrings, but you don't have pierced ears, so you couldn't wear my earrings. And Sunoko gets very sad, and the little girl says, but if you want, I could pierce your ears, and then you could wear my earrings. And Sunoko says, well, that's a good idea. So she gets this really sharp stick, and she gives it to the little girl, and the little girl drives it through her ear into the floor, and Sunoko is trapped. And at that moment, of course, the parents come to rescue the kids. So they're so upset with Sinoqua that they throw her into the fire. And as she's in the fire, she says, you may think you're rid of me, but I will come back and suck your blood. And out the ashes came and turned into mosquitoes. So that's, that's where we got mosquitoes. And that's a mosquito mask there on the right. And potlatch is a Chinook term. It's a trade term that means to give. And giving is a fundamental aspect of the Northwest Coast culture. So let's, let's look about uh, the economy. So we live in what we would call a market economy. We produce goods and services which you sell for money. Then you take that money and you can buy other goods and services. So that's um, the, basically the market economy that most countries have now. There's a broader economy. If you take money out of the picture, you can directly trade your good and service for some other goods and service. But they had what's called a gift economy. The most important thing among the tribes of the Northwest Coast was prestige, a prestige culture. Chiefs had prestige, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. So what they would do is give away goods, not for money, not for other goods, but for prestige. And that's the potlatch. When a chief gave a potlatch, they, this is a chief's hat, and then you'd see these hats with different numbers of rings on them. Every time a chief gave a potlatch, and these potlatches would last from three days to a week to longer, he would put another ring on his hat, showing that he was wealthy enough. He had enough prestige to give a potlatch. And so these hats, you can see there's the one in the middle without any. Look at these, four rings on that one, three on that one, that was a very, prestigious chief. So these are some quotes from different sources that we have that tells how the potlatch is so important within that culture. It in interconnects all things, a way of giving thanks, the essence of the Kwakutl culture, a way to gain prestige and wealth by giving gifts and an opulent feast. Some people said it's an ostentatious display of wealth. There are, potlatch can be given for many, many reasons, for the inheritance of things. And Dion talked about stories were told by certain people and owned by people. Well, when you pass your story down to somebody else, you could give a potlatch <laughs> to celebrate things like a marriage or a birth. Here's an interesting reason. Somebody who uh, lost their reputation, again, prestige, reputation, the most important things, to restore the reputation of someone who's been humiliated, you'd give a potlatch. So many reasons to give it. This is a picture of a, a, an old picture of a potlatch, and you can see all those goods that they give away. They would invite tribes from all around. Many tribes, hundreds of people would come to enjoy this and feast and, and share, get the wealth. But then if I went to somebody else's potlatch and got some gifts from them, and I wanted to get my prestige, I would have to throw a potlatch in my tribe and invite them to visit me, and I'd give them stuff back. 
So that's how it circulated the goods around. This is one of the most prestigious things that, would, that I could give, and it's a copper. And they would break coppers, and there was copper in, in, the, in, the, in the hills. This is a model, the top one, and I'm going to show you what it really looks like. That's a model of what's called a feast bowl. Now, you can imagine you have hundreds of people coming. You've got to feed them over many days. Can you imagine the size? I'm going to show you what one of those actually looks like of these bowls and spoons that they used to dish out the stuff. So this is a picture of a child, and that's, that's the, the real bowl. We have the model of it. You see that child in the middle? You can imagine how long that bowl is. And you look, it's so big, it rolls out on wheels. So they prepare all the food in these bowls, roll them out, and feed hundreds of people during these potlatches. These are some of the implements they use. This is like the fine china. So these are uh, ladles and spoons and bowls that they would use. These are all made out of horn, sheep horn bowls, ladles, and spoons. This is a special one. That's, that's uh, from the Olachan fish. That's called the candlefish. And so it had so much oil in it, so allegedly you could light it like a candle and it would burn. And I don't think that really happens, but they extract the oil put it in there, that's one of the most prized condiments that they would eat during these feasts, uh, the Olachan. This is, this is that ladle that I showed you previously. This is an eagle ladle. You can see it's all beautifully carved. Give you some idea, it's 22 inches long. And they distribute all the food from their big bowls with these huge ladles. And they dressed up in their finest clothes, and they'd dance, and they'd tell stories. Joan, you saw one of them, and you see how the native told those stories and embellished the stories. And this is some of the drums. They had lots of music going on, so they had drums of all kinds. You saw Gene Tagaban, the, 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 the storyteller, banging on his drum, and they would decorate the drums. And so these are some drums that we have. This is a box drum. So that's four feet tall, they'd hang it, and they would bang the inside of it, and it would make noise, tremendous noise, all through the, 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 the longhouse. On the side of that drum, that represents an octopus. So even though it's a human face in the middle, you can see the hair coming down. Those are the tentacles of the octopus. And on the bottom, the octopus has, has, has a, captured a, a salmon. They have whistles. This is a whistle, a carved whistle. And rattles, that rattle is an owl rattle. That's an oyster catcher rattle, and you can see all kinds of stuff going on in the back. If we had more time, we could tell you the stories that go behind these pieces. And there'd be dancers. You saw one of the dancers a moment ago. But 18, uh, 1885, the Canadian government wanted to make these Native Americans into Canadian citizens. They wanted to suppress and destroy their culture. And remember, I, uh, I showed you how important the potlatch is. It was central to these people's culture. This is the Canadian Indian Act. Every Indian or other person who engages or insists in celebrating the Indian festival known as the potlatch is guilty of a misdemeanor and shall be liable to imprisonment. So they suppressed it. The people tried to still have their smaller potlatches and secret potlatches. So a chief in Alert Bay in British Columbia, Dan Cramer, 1921, on Christmas Day, he figured the authorities, the, the, the Indian agents, the police would be busy celebrating Christmas. So quietly, he sent the word out. And he decided to have a nice potlatch. Over 300 people came to this potlatch. But unfortunately, they found out about it, the Canadian authorities. They raided the potlatch. 45 people were arrested. They seized all their wonderful paraphernalia. You got to realize this stuff, some of it is the chiefs, is very, very important to the tribe. 750 pieces were seized. And even worse than that, they then displayed it in the Anglican church, so counter to the Native American culture. And then it was dispersed all around the world. Museums all around the world got this stuff. Well, more recently, with, with current sensibility about the Native American heritage, both here as well as in Canada, this stuff is getting repatriated. And as a result, they, they established these places. Umista, in the Kwakuta language, means return of something important. And well, I'm going to show you a little bit about the Umista Cultural Center, where we got to visit. And actually, one of the pieces from, that we had in our collection was from that, that 
location. It's now back in that museum, and it's a centerpiece of that museum. And it's called the Chilcot Blanket, which hopefully we'll have time to talk about. So they've repatriated. And actually, this, this is, is Kevin Cranmer, Dan Cranmer's son, accepting back one of the pieces that were stolen during that potlatch to be put in the, the museum. This is another thing that was stolen. Look at this costume, this incredible costume. And these are the elders of the tribe now welcoming these things back home to where they belong in Alert Bay. The act was finally repealed in 1951, almost 70 years later. But the potlatch didn't become common practice again within the culture of the Northwest Coast until the 1970s. And this is a picture of a modern one. You can see all those things they give away. I have a little clip here that I want to show you. It's about a minute long. And you, I put down the things to look for as we go through this. And this is done by the tribe from Omista Cultural Center to tell you how important the potlatch is to them. My people the Potlatchewo have been guided by our ancestors. Our stories of origin are based on our first ancestors. Ceremonial masks tell of our beginning and share our identity and where we come from. <laughs> So this is the Omista Cultural Center, and I included this picture there. We had a chance to visit, and you can see, a, and this is a picture I took. You can see the dad with his child and the joy and pride. They're passing it on from one generation to another now. It's a living culture, and it, the, the people are flourishing and recapturing their culture. That's the longhouse we actually visited. That's the entrance of the cultural center. That's their entrance of the longhouse. The question was, where is this? And it's at the north coast of Vancouver Island, but I'll show you that. Let me, let me go ahead and tell you a story that as somebody that really feels passionately, not only about the objects, but about the people. This story, this is something that was in my collection, I briefly, our collection, I briefly mentioned it, but this is what gives us such joy. We went to visit them because of this story. So this is called the Paris Blanket, and I'll tell you why it's called the Paris Blanket. This is a, a picture by Edward Curtis, uh, done about 1920, and that's a blanket that we owned in our collection. It's a, called a Quacutal Blanket, that's a chief wearing it. That blanket was a very special blanket. George Hunt was the prefector of the Hudson Bay Colony store in Alert Bay. Hudson Bay Colony, they had stores all through Canada. They were getting beaver pelts, and they were trading goods with the, with the uh, natives. Mary Ebbett Hunt, otherwise her native name is Anna Slaga, that's the woman in the middle, was a very important woman from the Tlinga tribe, a different tribe. But she traveled south, met George, and married. And they had a large family. That's a picture of the family. Mary Ebbett Hunt was a very important person. She was a, 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 very, a, a princess in the Tlingit. And she developed a particular weaving technique for these Chilcot blankets. The blankets had goat hair a warp, and it was on, on cedar bark. And she developed a very special knotting technique. The blanket, the blanket was produced in Alert Bay, which is, well, I'll use the pointer. 
right here. So there's Vancouver Island. This is Victoria. Vancouver's here. Right up in this room. I'm going to show you a better picture of that. She produced it. She produced 13 blankets in her lifetime. And you can tell it was her because she put a little, almost like a signature or trademark in the corner of these blankets. As best we could figure out, and this part of the story is a little murky as far as the provenance, it was given to one of her children. Now, a terrible part of the story, which we don't have time to talk about today, is that they would take the children from the parents and put them in these schools to try to suppress their native culture and teach them the Western way. And there's been stories recently about the children that were killed and abused in these schools, both in the US and Canada. So she went off to school, taken away from her parents, and had one of these special blankets. And then it disappeared for a long time until many years later, so something happened there. It appeared at auction at Sotheby's. We bought it at that auction. We knew it was a special blanket. So we took, we, it, we took it here to Miami. It was in our collection for many years. And then along when we moved from our home to Key Biscayne, and with all this move to repatriate important things, we said, you know, let, let's, we, we, sh we shouldn't keep this. This should go back somewhere. But what we decided to do we, was we were approached by Christie's. And so went back to New York to be sold by Christie's from our collection. Christie's was not selling it in New York at the time. They had closed their uh, Native American sales in this country, but they were selling ethnographic goods from their office in Paris. So it traveled from Miami to New York to Paris. In Paris, and if you've ever sold things at auction, you set a reserve, well, it didn't really sell. People didn't realize how important it was. However, what had happened is the people in Alert Bay, where it came from, heard about the auction. They heard about it the day before. They didn't have the money to buy it. But what happened was it didn't sell. And because it didn't sell, then we got post-auction offers to buy it from us. Two of them were from collectors that had the money and said, we'll send you the check if you send us the blanket. But one of them, and we didn't know who it was at the time, said, we don't have the money. However, if you're willing to wait, we put in a request for the Canadian government to get the money. So we knew it was a museum, and we suspected it might be from where it came from. So we told the other people that wanted to pay us on the spot, no, we'll wait, and hopefully they'll get the money. We waited three months. Six months later, we finally got the money, and we sent it back, and it ended up back in Alert Bay, back where it came from. They were so, so it's called the Paris Blanket because that's where it was, or where it went on auction. So that's what the long journey home ended up in the Umistra Cultural Center, those pictures I showed you before. And this is a better map to show you where it is in the north part of Vancouver Island on the other end from Victoria. Very difficult place to get to. No cruise ship stops there, but very, very important place for the Native Americans. So we actually went there on a National Geographic expedition cruise. That's the boat we were on. There were 49 passengers. That's a picture of the town. Not much of a town. That's Alert Bay. But it has this beautiful cultural center. That's the entrance. A beautiful, well-preserved um, uh, burial grounds. And this piece, this is the blanket there, is the central and most important piece in that Umista collection of amazing pieces. That's the case they built for it. They reproduced it on a coffee mug. That's a picture of Anna Slaga, Mary Ebbets Hunt, on the coffee mug as well. There she is in the case. There's that picture I showed you at the beginning of a chief wearing our blanket. And there's their logo in the top picture. So, when we got to visit, they were so excited to meet us and talk to us, and we were excited to meet them. The family of Mary Ebbets Hunt still lives there. The Hunt family are some, one of the most important artists today producing Northwest Coast art, and uh, we have that piece in the museum, and we're just happy that it found its way home. This was such an important event. The National Post is the Canadian version of USA Today. It's the National Magazine. That was the headline in April of 2014 when it came home. 
Vancouver Island First Nation recovers historic blanket that turned up at Parrot Auction a hundred years after it disappeared. There's, a, there's another picture of it. We thought that was the end of the story. There's, another, there's a postscript to the story. The American Museum of Natural History has one of the best collections of Northwest Coast art. It was displayed, have, have ever, any of you ever seen it? Nobody? A few people, okay. It was displayed in an old, dingy hall. It came to them in about the 1920s, and it was the way they made museum exhibitions at the time. It was not well lit, old, dingy cases. It was, it was the most beautiful, important pieces, terribly displayed. They closed the hall for five years. They remodeled it. And again, now with current sensibility towards the Native American cultures, they went to each one of the tribes and said, listen, we're redoing our hall. We're going to do the displays, but you tell us what stories you want to tell in your section and what's most important to you to tell in your section of this hall. And so they helped them design the hall. So that's Joan there in 22, so it's still at the tail end of the pandemic. She's wearing her mask. And that's the beautiful displays they put up. So we went around and we spent the whole day there literally studying the pieces, studying what the natives thought were important. And what happened when we got to the section on the quacutal blankets? Over here, you can't read it. The entire story I just told you about our blanket showing up in Paris and coming home, that's what that whole thing is about, Mary Ebbets Hunt. And there's a, that, that picture is now in the, the North American Hall, North American Indian Hall, the American Museum of Natural History. That's a picture of our blanket. And we happen to know because you can't really tell from this picture, right here, there's a little black line, if you look real carefully, that was a Native American repair. So the blanket had torn and they repaired it. That's our blanket, and it's pictured in the hall. So we were blown away when we saw that this was so important when they asked the Quacutal to redesign their part of the hall, that's what they put up, the story of that blanket, among other things, but there it was. So, uh, we were really, it, it made us feel so good that it went home and how much they appreciate it. So this is, a, again, a picture from the a long house when we attended the ceremony in Umista. And if there's any questions, we're delighted to, to answer them. The I'm how sorry? Much you, how much did you get from the blanket? <laughs> you know what? I'll tell you, but I'm going to tell you something else. What's more important is how good we feel about it. So collectors, there's a difference between a collector and a possessor. Actually, some of our pieces were owned by Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol was a possessor. He didn't care about sharing it. He, if you know the story of Andy Warhol, he had warehouses full of stuff and beautiful stuff. But he didn't want to understand the context and the people and who produced them. He just collected it because of the aesthetic. We're collectors. We want to learn about the people that produce this. We want to know the context. We want things to, like this to happen for it to go home. But to put a value on it, I could say priceless. What did we get? We got $25,000, which is more than we paid. But that isn't the important thing. This to us was priceless to see the article in the paper, to see how important this was, to go there. And, we went, and when we visited that site, it was a Sunday afternoon. The director of the museum came in to, to meet us because she was so excited on a Sunday afternoon. And we helped, by the way, she gave us that little mug I showed you. So that to us was more important than the money. So the question was, what kind of museum do we, do we have our collection in? That's another story. So, so we have a master collection. We have two children. They grew up with this stuff all around them in our house and totem poles and masks, and neither of them are interested in the collection. We can't pass a passion on to children. So we have been in discussion with museums, and right now there is a museum in Massachusetts that's considering it. So the first thing, the director needs to be interested. Second thing is the collection committee needs to say, yes, this is something we're interested in getting because they need to take care of it. They need to store it. There's a lot of, you know, to keep these things and preserve them. Um, so that's the second step. 
So we're past the collection committee, and now we're in discussion about how we're going to do this. But we've, we've been in and out of discussion with several museums over the years. Our hope is that it will end up in a museum as a collection. It might not. You know, uh, the, there's, a, there's a consultant who once wrote a book, Life is Short, Art is Long. And you know, where, where it ends up after we're no longer here, I hope it's a museum. It may or may not be. Any other questions? <laughs> How much does Christie's? How much was the, 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 the commission? Okay. Well, the twenty-five thousand dollars was the, the total price. Okay. Auction houses get commissions. Auction houses charge for shipping, storage, publicity in the catalogs. So they get a lot of money on both ends of an auction. If you go through the especially the big houses. Currently today, Christie's gets twenty-five percent buyer's and seller's commission. So if they sell something for $10,000, they end up with $5,000 in Christie's pocket, and only $5,000 ends up going to the... However, Christie's knew that piece was important. So you can negotiate. If you have a Picasso, you can probably get it down less than 25,000, 25% of the, the hammer price. What Christie's told us, without negotiating, they thought this piece was so important, they said, we will take care of shipping. We will take care of insurance. No charge to you. We will give it a page in the catalog. And instead of 25%, we're only going to charge you 10%. So because they wanted this piece very much, because you know, if, if, they, if a auction house puts out a, a, a Monet, that's, you know, that's going to draw other people to send their stuff to that house. So they want important pieces in whatever niche they're auctioning off. So, so yeah, auction houses do very well. <laughs> um, in the beginning of the presentation, a number of the items you had called them rattles. Rattles, yes. And are the rattle? Are the, did they make rattles for ceremony, or did they make them? You know, you think of rattles as baby toys, or yeah. what was? So, so the question was, were the rattles made for okay. ceremonial use or for toys? They were absolutely for ceremonial use. They were not playthings for children. And none of these things were play things for children. We, we do have, we did, this is a rattle that Joan pictured when she told you the salmon. So some of the rattles were specific to the chief. And they told stories of the chief. You know, it's an old thing with the story. Some of them were specifically used for the shamans, for healing. And the, and the shamans were the only ones that could use them. So they had specific purposes. But they were definitely not placements. They were very important yeah, ceremonial objects. Not toys. Not toys. Who got to live in the house with the chief? Because you have 60 people living in a house. Oh. So who, who was chosen to live in the house? Okay, so the question was, who lives in these long houses if there are 40 or 60 people? They were family units. So, so there'd be the tribe, and then they'd have clans in the tribe, and then there'd be subgroups under the clan. So, so these are like family units. They were extended families. So each extended family would have their own longhouse, and then the chief and his descendants. And it was matrilineal, so the, the, the rights for things went down through the mother, not the father. And uh, it, was every, it was hereditary. So Dan Cranmer, I showed you his picture, and, and his father was the one that had that, that uh, Kevin, um, De Dan and Kevin. So these were, he, Dan's a chief, I got it wrong. Kevin's a chief because his father Dan was a chief, and his son will be a chief. But the inheriting, inheriting rights is through the mother. Yeah. Okay. Any other any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. I we do have a few things if you want to look at some of the objects we showed you in in the presentation.